Thank you so much, music team. That gives me joy to begin this message today. Let's go to God and, and pray and ask him to bless our time. Dear Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Comfort us, O God, in the darkest corners of our hearts with the only good news there is, the hope of eternal life through Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Dear brothers and sisters, at the beginning of the book of Job, we get special insight into what's going on in Job's life with all he's going through, even though Job doesn't right away or at all get that insight. We see that God allows Satan to test Job through suffering and loss within limits because God knows what he's ultimately going to do is to strengthen and to vindicate Job's faith. But Job and his friends and his wife, they don't know this. And we heard and we saw how they reacted the last couple of weeks. Job's wife says to her husband, why don't you just curse God and die? And Job's friends, well, the best thing they probably did was just to show up and to sit with him, to be present for a while, because as soon as they opened their mouths, they, they started attacking him. Job even says it's like, it's like there's an army that's like laying siege against him and attacking him. They, they basically said, well, Job, you know, nobody suffers as greatly as, as, as you are unless they must have also sinned greatly. So out with it, Job. What did you do? Why is God, a te- you, you must be such a terrible person. And so Job cries out to God, acknowledging that he's not without sin, but, but he maintains his, his innocence, his integrity. And in his anguish, he, he pleads for someone to clear his shame, to restore his good name, his, his integrity. And he expresses his deep loneliness in his, his fight for innocence but as he looks around, there's no one there to support him. Isn't that really the story of one of our own deepest unspoken fears? To face life alone, leaving behind a legacy of shame? It's why when we feel boxed in, by our circumstances, suffocating and claustrophobic in times of of trial and suffering, we might also cry out to God and say, where are you, God? This is how Job felt. He felt boxed in, hedged in by God. Notice what he says. This is towards the beginning of the book, chapter 3. Why is life given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For sighing has become my daily food, my groans pour out like water. What I feared has come upon me, what I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness, I have no rest, but only turmoil. Have you ever felt like God was your enemy? Maybe you wouldn't say it quite like that, but underneath it all, the thought lingers sometimes, doesn't it? You know the Lord is everywhere and he has set the boundaries of your life, where you were born, the circumstances of it all, all these things that are beyond your control. So when you're feeling trapped in this unpredictable suffering that comes inevitably through life and you're trying to see how how God fits into all of it, do you ever find yourself pleading your case to God and saying things like, God, what did I do to deserve this? God, if you love me, why do you keep me in these circumstances? And God, show me that you've got my back. Maybe it's not that we doubt his presence always, but we struggle sometimes to understand how he is there. How could his, his presence be loving and good in our lives when it feels sometimes like he's boxing us in with no way out? 
That's, that's the struggle Job had. When you feel abandoned and are tempted to believe even God isn't on your side, then the hope for an advocate becomes incredibly real. It's like facing a judge in a courtroom without a defense attorney. Right? Kind of terrifying. And so Job knew he would ultimately face God, the, the true judge, one day, but he, he cries out feeling like if he had to do that, he, he'd be all alone with his legacy in ruins. I think we maybe all share a similar fear in our hearts. Deep down, the fear of judgment and how it will shape our legacy. I mean, we live in a legacy-obsessed kind of culture, whether it's we're talking about quarterbacks in the NFL and the legacy that they leave and how they compare, you know, who's the greatest of all time and that kind of a thing, Um, how we're going to be remembered. Perhaps one of our greatest fears isn't that we'll be forgotten, but that we'll be remembered for our worst moments, our shameful words and deeds and the things that we would rather forget completely. And so like Job, we need someone to speak on our behalf. We need an intercessor. Here's what Job says a couple chapters later. He says, if only, if only there were someone to mediate between us, God. Someone to bring us together. Someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. You ever feel this way? You ever think to yourselves, God, why can't I just catch a break? God, please just let me catch my breath. It's relentless. Or have you ever, in the middle of the night, desperately wished for someone who could understand your plight and and mediate on your behalf? And so I think Job's cry is, is his cry for a mediator, someone to kind of negotiate and bring, you know, God to the table and and hash it out and and make things right is one that I think we can relate to, especially when we're tempted to feel all isolated and alone in our struggles. And yet, Job doesn't completely despair. In in his darkness, here's what Job concludes. And in this, we also start to find our own Christian hope. Here's what Job goes on to say. Even now, my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My intercessor is my friend. As my eyes pour out tears to God on behalf of a man, he pleads with God as one pleads for a friend. And then he says, only a few years will pass before I take the path of no return. So who could be an intercessor, an advocate, a true friend, a a redeemer for Job? It's Jesus. Because none of his friends could be that for him or his wife. They, They failed him, right? So how about how about for you? Who who can always be there for you? Always speak for you, right your wrongs, vindicate you, and give you an eternal legacy. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can give you a life of forgiveness for your failings, a life of meaning and purpose and ultimate hope no matter what you're going through here. You know, Job likely thought, the way he expresses himself, it's like he, he's, he thought he's probably more likely to die before he ever was vindicated here on this earth, right? You think about that. Maybe you feel in your circumstances or because of how things have, have turned out that you're, you're kind of stuck. Job, Job wonders. But, but his perspective, you see, doesn't just stay here. It's not just fixed on the earth. His perspective focuses on heaven. Job acknowledges here in these words that his His true advocate, his true witness is in heaven. 
Despite his suffering and his friend's accusations, he describes his intercessor as a compassionate friend who pleads with God on his behalf. And this is so crucial for Job as he reflects on life's brevity, knowing that he will soon himself face death, which he calls the the path of no return. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? Regardless of how many days we have or how much suffering we endure, we all face the finality of death. It's exactly what God told Adam and Eve would be the consequence for their sin, their disobedience against God. I remember two years ago at my grandma's funeral, after the service, they were carrying out her coffin and they needed somebody else to help carry it so I went over there and walked grandma out to the hearse loaded her up into the back closed the door I can still hear it click and that was it or was it see see Job even in his darkest moment contemplating and and being confronted with death, the finality of it all, the seeming finality of it all. If you take God out of the picture, that's what it seems like. And yet in that, Job expresses his deepest hope, the same hope that we as Christians have today. So let's listen to his famous words now, probably the most famous words from the book of Job. Job says, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed. Yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Here we arrive at the climax of the book. And after this, it's kind of like Job settles down a little bit. He expresses here this desire for his words to last forever. He declares that they be inscribed on lead Carved in granite, right? It, today we might say, I wish they'd be you know, encoded in the blockchain or preserved in the Starlink network or something like that. Job desires a memorial that testifies to his, to his innocence, to his vindication with the, with the inscription, my vindicator will prove me innocent. And so we ask the question, who is this vindicator who is this redeemer of whom job speaks and though job couldn't see how it would have all come to fruition yet thousands of years before he came job foresees his redeemer and ours and of course it's jesus it's jesus the one who proclaimed i am the resurrection and the life to Mary and Martha in their grief over their dear brother Lazarus. And there's some striking parallels, if you think about it, between their story, Mary and Martha, and and Job's story. Mary and Martha, their brother Lazarus is sick, he's dying, so they send a message to Jesus, yet he stays there, doesn't do anything right away, and Lazarus dies. This, this puzzles everyone, and, and, then, and then Jesus says to his disciples, well, you know, this will be okay, because this will be for my, my Father's glory. Jesus is thinking about the, the glory of God in all this. And, and similarly, the prologue of Job shows us God's plan and purpose in all this, even though it's hard to understand, and how ultimately it's all going to work out for the glory of God. And so we might consider what will be to the unending praise and glory of God, the the eternal praise and glory of God. Well, when Jesus returns, 
on the last day and calls us forth from the grave and transforms our our resurrected bodies to be glorious like his. This is what Job foresees and proclaims as his hope. His hope in the resurrection. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, friends, this is also our Christian hope, what, what we believe and what we confess, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Because of Jesus' perfect life, his innocent suffering and death, and his own triumphant resurrection from the dead, we are redeemed, bought back, set free from sin, death, and Satan's power. And so a glorious resurrection, an everlasting life, Await those who hold firmly in faith to Jesus. This is Christianity. It's all by God's grace as a gift to those who look at Jesus and say, I know that my Redeemer lives. And because he lives, so too shall I. There's a picture I sometimes show in start class that I think helps to illustrate this. Do you you see it? There's a Bible verse there, printed, inscribed, whatever, on the the wheelchair, Isaiah 35, verse 6, which says, Then will the lame, right, people can't walk, leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Friends, where is Jesus in our pain You might wonder if he's there. Job did. But look at the cross. God addressed our deepest pain there and dealt with our greatest problem, sin and death, there. And because Jesus lives, because he rose, our Redeemer, we will too. This was Job's strength. And it's ours as well, our our true life is in heaven now where we'll be reunited with our loved ones. This is the Christian hope. No matter what we face, we have this hope. Heaven changes everything as that song goes. Even if our bodies break down, we know it can still be well with my soul here and now. Oh, how comforting this all is. I returned late last night from visiting my parents for a couple days. As I mentioned last week, my father had a stroke a few weeks ago. The, the left side of his body isn't working too well. He, but he's, he's recovering. Thanks be to God. And I, I was encouraging him to keep doing those exercises, Dad, so he can, he can kind of walk with a walker now. Even though the wheelchair is still kind of close at hand for the time being. And you know, maybe it will be for me one day too. Seems maybe stroke runs in the family. I don't know. We probably all have something. That does. But my hope isn't just in monitoring my health, you know, getting my blood work done and checking out the LDLs and the blood pressure and whatever else. I got to learn what all those numbers mean one of, these, one of these days. But my hope isn't in all that. I hope yours isn't ultimately in that either because our hope, like, well, Paul says if our, in the New Testament, if our hope is just for this life, just for this earth, like if I'm going to spend all that, I got, all that I can have and all that I can earn just to preserve my life and make it last a little longer because I don't know what's coming and I'm afraid what's next. And Paul says, you, we're, you know, if our hope is just for this life, we're, we're to be, we Christians are to be pitied. But no, our, our hope is in our Redeemer, risen, glorified, and returning And friends, so if your faith is in Jesus Christ, your Redeemer, then like Job, you can look forward to seeing him face to face one day in glory with your body made brand new. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you will go through. And then together, we will be vindicated then together we will be glorified. 
no matter how you feel right now, you, you are not alone. Together we will be with the Lord. So reflect on this as you hear these words, these comforting words, often read at Christian funerals from the book of Revelation where John says, and I, and I heard a loud voice from the throne, this is in heaven, <laughs> saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. Friends, when we focus on our Savior Jesus, we have everything we need. We have one who can calm storms, drive out demons, deliver from cancer and car accidents and heart attacks and strokes, and who ultimately will one day dry our every tear. We, we have one who has the wisdom to know exactly what we need and when we need it, because his goal isn't just to give us the good life here, but to give us the best life forever with him. We have a Savior who loves us enough to do whatever it took, whatever it takes, so that you can be forgiven, so that you can be saved, so that you can be with him in heaven, even if it meant himself going to the cross to die in our place. But Jesus has the, the power to, to rise from the dead, and, and he promises to do the same for us. In the meantime, he now sits at the right hand of the Father, exercising his divine power for our good. We live by faith and not by sight. But there he pleads our case. Think of it. Our advocate before the Father, our intercessor, our friend, the Bible says, who continuously before the Father presents to him the proof of our redemption through his now glorified wounds. No longer scars, but trophies of his victory and evidence of his love, etched forever in his human body, the Son of God. One of us, glorified, just like you will be. And so... Maybe there's no better way to end than with that last verse that we sang in the song before the sermon. He lives! All glory to his name. He lives. My Jesus still the same. He lives. And oh, the sweet joy this sentence gives. I know that my Redeemer lives. Do you? Amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding all human philosophy, all human technology, all human medicine. May that peace guard our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus until we, with our own eyes, see him face to face in resurrection glory. Amen. Amen.